Griffin's going to start this. All right, so we have a very, very short um, roadmap and open discussion overview, and then we'll hope to get to the question and discussion part quickly. So this is just a summary of what you've seen today, um, what's coming up soon with ITB2 Transmart. You saw the um, 4C presentation I gave earlier this morning, and we're working on a new set of research questions, in particular focused on perhaps um, obesity, age, and how um, the interplay of that and predicting risk. Uh, we hope to have a new round of analyses that we send out to sites either later this fall or early winter. Um, there's continued trying updates that you just heard about um, that will be over the next several months. Uh, we're hoping that the new I2B2 UI um, could replace the current web client early next year. There'll probably be a release version, uh, um, an early release version of it this year, so you can start playing around with it and practice um, uh, building new plugins uh, for its framework and testing the compatibility with your existing plugins. Um, Transmart is working on new single sign-on capabilities, and uh, we heard earlier about the long-term roadmap of, of Transmart. Um, Jeff and others mentioned the improved integration of ITB2 on top of OMOP, and that will be available um, as part of what we're working on the Dell projects next year. And then a uh, major um, thing we're working on in ITB2, which won't be done this year, but we'll have um, initial phase one of this and more long-term expansions of it is with the digital twin computational phenotype pipeline that uh, we heard earlier with our keynote speaker, and Sean elaborated it more. Do you want to say a couple more words about sure. the? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, as you can tell, we're kind of been gearing up with this for a while. Um, we actually have uh, some some work that happens uh, in the Mass General Brigham enclave currently. We're working on the architecture that will actually make that into the kind of production operation that we talked about on the slides. But it does function in terms of like building uh, those phenotypes, and it has been actually used by a, well, actually, we produced about 200 papers <laughs> based upon that, not us, uh, but at MGB, uh, right, where they used that during during uh, the past year or so. Now, the idea is that, um, number one, we need to expand the way that we perform the loyalty cohort so that it adapts to every um, site. It, we did find that because of different patterns of behavior that folks have uh, doctors and, and, and clinicians and nurses have in terms of, uh, you know, scheduling or, or having uh, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, primary care uh, medical exams and so forth, that it, it varies a tiny bit. Not that much, frankly, we, we, but, but it does vary. So we, we're, we fit the loyalty cohort at each site, which means that we kind of have to go site by site in our expansion for that and validate it and so forth. The phenotype operation has several different kinds of approaches. So there's really the thought is we put a library together of lots of different ways to do phenotypes. But we do have out of the box some semi-supervised and supervised methods that we can use to uh, add to those. And then, of course, there's the real work, which is the ongoing DevOps of continuously creating those such that we can actually build digital twins into the, um, into the entire network. And so the idea would be then that um, by working kind of hospital by hospital, um, we would be able to put a full digital twin program together over time, kind of testing the uh, waters for you know what we need to focus on in terms of publication. 4CE is really what kind of directs, I have to say, a lot of you know the uh, 
scientific operation in terms of what direction we go in right now. Certainly when an act gets going, it will be used in the same, same way to help direct, you know, scientifically what the best direction is to develop and, 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 and capitalize the digital twin. The options are, you know, uh, modeling clinical studies um, and feasibility, uh, population studies, and then, uh, you know, eventually we do intend to get into uh, personalized uh, healthcare with this uh, digital twin uh, approach for our patients. So that's, um, that's kind of the, the, the direction. We're hoping to do something that we call phase one in the fall, such that we would have this available at a number of hospitals. Um, and uh, probably hospitals in this in this room, um, uh, and um, well, not you know, um, represented. <laughs> represented. Thanks, Griffin. So uh, we will, um, you know, that, that I think that's the that's the kind of roadmap for working on on that. So the question I think is perhaps um, right now, is there something that's missing? For whatever reason, did we did miss something? Did you hope to hear something yeah. at this conference today that you didn't, uh, that we should be including? Yeah. That is a very interesting um, approach in that. Um, can you repeat the question? Yes, I can repeat the question. The question is, why don't we open up the shrine to the public? That's the question. And um, you can imagine, right, some of the resistance that we would get to doing that. Um, based on, you know, well, you know, we don't want people to know all this stuff about our healthcare system. Um, so, you know, is there a way you could obfuscate it enough that it wouldn't lose its meaning, but, you know, you wouldn't know, you know, that it was our healthcare system that had all those malpractice cases or whatever it was, right? And, and there is a lot of interesting uh, and, and, and very, you know, controversial things in these databases. I mean, how many underage abortions did you do, right? I mean, there's a lot there. So um, you, we do have to be, you know, aware of that. But having said that, uh, this idea, right, that you can get to the facts directly without having to go through, you know, the news and so forth is very, compelling in many ways That's so quick on yeah yeah please there's um it's not itb2 based but i think columbia has um a public website that allows you to do you can select one or two concepts and it'll tell you 
how many patients have the combination of those things. They make it available to the public. There's a bunch of obfuscation to it. So small um, numbers are a mask, and there's some sophisticated algorithms for doing that to make sure that things remain um, de-identified. But it's way stripped down functionality. It's nowhere near the capabilities of whole ITB2. Um, in ITB2, we have some obfuscation capabilities, but it's very easy to get around those and end up identifying an individual patient. So that's why it's part of an institution. And when you are within a hospital and you start using the ITB2 website, in addition to the stuff that's inside of ITB2, you also are bound by your institution's HIPAA policies and other stuff. So there's the institutional aspect of it that protects the patients in addition to what we're doing ITB2. When you just make it completely public, like a Columbia version, you have to um, really limit the kinds of functionality before you're able to identify patients. So I, I would just add that the All of Us program has data on a half a million people that you can query. There's a public interface that is like a weak version of I2B2, and there's a, and you can enroll in the program, anybody can, and do queries on that data, which is extremely rich. It's got genomic data as well. It, because it's not, site, it's uh, outside of HIPAA because the data comes from patients. And that's a, a huge, uh, a, a huge benefit. And as far as I2B2, my nonprofit uses I2B2 and has publicly, we have an I2B2 system that anybody can access and do queries on our data. So we are using it for that kind of data. So I just want to remind you, so that's consented data. Right, that's the difference, it's consent. Hopefully this helps folks that are on the Zoom here. Yeah, I would just um, offer that. Uh, I think, you know, curating insights that can be translatable or me more meaningful and insightful to the general public, um, there's still kind of like a one more step, right? So being able to do queries is great for somebody who's sophisticated, who may also have a health journey, and so they're, you know, kind of like uh, being their own um, advocate. But if we have somebody in our family that can't translate technology, can't translate, you know, healthcare terminology, um, there, I think there still is a gap between being able to, you know, find out meaningful information about your your disease or your healthcare journey, and then being able to have that be translated in a meaningful way that you know can be consumable, transportable, disseminable. So I think there is you know, still an opportunity to kind of bridge that gap. And let me say, we, we don't want to be too fanciful here because I think that um, that kind of, I don't know, breeds a certain insincerity maybe, but just to kind of dream for a minute. So you can imagine that the, you know, from, a, from a digital twin point of view, right, I mean, this could become a sea of anonymized, but you know, so, so kind of like a, the, the ultimate synthetic data, if you want to think of it that way. And in some ways, that is the vision, not, and, and the things that Saeed said about autonomy and so forth in that realm also fits, right? So you can imagine, you know, those twins interacting. And why is that important? Well, in, in, a, in, a, in an epidemic, that was very important, right? Is, is exactly, you know, that was the whole deal was how was it that they were interacting and passing, you know, and if we had had the digital twin model operating at that time, we would have known early on that there were asymptomatic cases out there. And that was, that was something that really confused the entire scientific establishment to the point that they didn't understand the kind of, um, the kind of quarantines that had to be done until it was really too late. Um, and if they had had those models operating, that would have become clear right off the bat. So, you know, there, there's a lot of value to that, but, that, but that's, that's a ways away and we don't wanna be too, you know. But anyway, but you, yes, so, so, so maybe we could address some of that in, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come over to you, Mike. I've never looked or felt more like Phil Donahue in my life. Thanks. Uh, so, sort of related, but uh, a, a bit more technical uh, question about uh, digital twins. Uh, do you see uh, going 
beyond the I2B2 model here because I see um, fundamental difficulties the I2B2 model which is derived it's more kind of a data warehousing model but if if you think of the new data types let's see I want to work with um, uh, histology data and uh, also the image data that taps into the AI uh, pipelines. It's hard to really modify the ontology on the fly. You see, uh, do we have a, new, a model already for the GG twins or it's just still not defined? So let me try to repeat that question. Um, so I think what you're asking is, in the I2B2 model, it kind of apparently uses this kind of simplistic approach, right, of um, concepts being observed at a certain time on a certain patient with maybe some values associated with it. But it doesn't go into the detail that you might have in a imaging study or, uh, you know, complex electrophysiology and so forth that maybe could be utilized. And um, I'll let Griff Griffin's actually done a lot of thinking about this. The bottom line is that at some level, so, and the question is, could we expand that? And the, the bottom line is, at some level, when you put a system together, the trick is to put all the data and kind of the same dimension, right? Which can be tricky, right? I mean, it's like, you, you, because you, it's like, where do you start with doing that? And so, really, the, the key to I2B2 is that it makes everything into this fact, right? Now, it can be... So if you have it start with an image, what you have to do is you have to reduce it to a certain number of features. It could be a thousand features, but it has to be a certain number of features, right? Um, and so you need that kind of pre-processing aspect of it in an unsupervised way to kind of put an imaging in, in uh, image in there. It, it just doesn't reduce to that same dimensionality, and so therefore you do have to kind of you know. And I'm not sure. I've never really envisioned a way that we can get around that dimensionality. Yeah, I, I think we're used to an I2B2, thinking of I2B2 as a self-contained thing. In the digital um, twin pipeline, it's really I2B2 is this container of uh, extracted features. And there's a lot of external processes that you're going to have to go to. The loyalty calculations are sending out to a separate Docker that has R scripts on it that's processing which patients are loyal patients, and then that result of that is going back into I2B2. Similarly, um, external tools for natural language processing, image processing will extract features. Those get put into I2B2 along with pointers to go back to the external data sets if an investigator needs more information on it. So it's really a collection of lots of separate processes that run and feed the results into I2B2. And you know, we're going to have to develop this framework on how all that is managed um, and how I2B2 interacts with those external systems. Do we have uh, a model or some, of some kind as a conceptual level, not at, uh, with the real data for the public to access? Uh, I think it was the concept, saying what's the conceptual model for this? Conceptual model, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, um, the, uh, the thing that's common across these are lists of patients and the features that they have. So there may be something, some kind of image processing tool out there. We don't, it doesn't really matter so much what the image looks like or if it's genomic data. It's, uh, it's calling out here's a list of um, patient IDs, numbers, and the features that get pulled back from them that go, get loaded into I2B2. So as long as you're talking about things in the context of Here's a list of patients who have certain features, and that's how you uh, link together different um, different services or um, uh, um, uh, uh, wrappers around functions that do these different kinds of capabilities. That, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's always kind of been this vision that perhaps, you know, something could be done that's like bigger and better. And so the, the, the idea was, you know, maybe, you know, like, what about, uh, you know, 
image processing. Can you adopt something like image processing to dot, you know, to, to, to deal with this kind of data with a convolutional neural network, you know, kind of approach or something like that? But each of those kinds of data, when you look at it very carefully, depend on a characteristic that they have, right, that, that allows that. And they can't actually expand beyond that. So convolutional neural nets are great for images because each pixel is related to the pixel next to it, right? But you can't, like, put data in a 2D format and expect that unless you did something special. So what we actually have is kind of this timeline of features that are occurring with, um, with individuals. And those individuals could be patients. And by the way, um, in Aaron's case, he made those individuals that were drinks, right? <laughs> they were different kinds. <laughs> 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 but nonetheless, right, the bottom line is you can, you can have different, you know, but, but what, we're, we're, what we're relying on is different, uh, this, this timeline, right, of, of, of observations or things that are occurring. And whatever we do in the most complex data you can imagine, it reduces to some set of features that are in a, in a, in a timeline um, on... Um, occurring with, with to, 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 to an individual. And so um, going beyond that, right, in terms of like a two-dimensional, even a three-dimensional approach would have to, uh, would then have to be applied to all the data. And since we're, our, 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 most of the data we currently get, right, is in this timeline, we can't really advance to a two-dimensional approach if we expect to continue to be able to process to the best of our ability, the data that already is coming in in this timeline. And most healthcare is all coming in that way. Maybe someday, right, and then with the digital twins in particular, we can go to the two dimensional array, right, of a, spa a spatial array where people are interacting, certainly two dimensionally, like on, a, on this floor, right? And obviously, perhaps three dimensionally, if you're in a hospital and you've got vents going from one place to another and you're worried about, you know, bacteria traveling from one room to another and so forth. Um, but at present, you know, the best model we have that can kind of put together everything we've had and everything we can do in the future is this kind of uh, timeline of, of, of uh, events and observations. This is a great question of, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes, Hi. <clears throat> Hi. So, um, Two things, please. Number one, very quickly, regarding roadmap, I understand that Nick Benick has suggested that internationalization is important. So I just wanted to re reiterate that. Thank you. Yes, our, our folks in India think so too, yeah. Okay, and, and the second thing is regarding open discussion. There was something during, the, um, during one of the presentations that mentioned that I2B2 has, um, uh, ev excuse me, um, uh, facts that have dates associated with them, and it's basically a date for that fact. But it's a start date, or only one date. But in my experience, there's a start date and an end date. Um, and so, for example, we're utilizing that for our um, uh, social and environmental determinants of health, which we consider these determinants of health to be exposures for a patient. And so there's a start date and an end date, but we only have really seen the end date used in the queries if we're running a temporal query. And I'm wondering if you gentlemen, being the experts, can inform us, is that accurate that the end date is really only used for temporal queries? Um, so I'm trying to think about our interfaces that we have in I2B2. Correct. It, how the, in, how and how our UI works. works. So our, our, the, the web service doesn't work that way. It actually has a start date and an end date that you can use. But I do believe that the query tool only exposes a start date, other than for, for your typical queries, right? So where you're talking about, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the Venn diagram, you can add temporal constraints. And those temporal constraints, uh, I do believe they look at, you know, before and after the start date, right? Now, 
we built different interfaces at different times and thrown them away because they didn't really work out. And I, so in the RPDR, we do have a start and end date, but I think, yeah, but I don't think we do. Yeah. If you're thinking of ITV as an observational database, and these are time points, and the start date's really what's most relevant, but in the digital twin part, once we start putting in loyalty cohorts, computational phenotypes, we do have a better sense of this is the time period when a patient had a condition. So it may become more and more important over Maybe, time. so, so the model, right, so the schema has a start date and end date, of course, and, and, and truly everything is in some kind of an interval. It really isn't a point in time unless you're a dot, right? <laughs> so, so, so indeed, right, and, and, and a lot of the uh, uncertainty can sometimes be expressed that way too, and that you only know something within a certain period of time, not because it occurred within that time, but because you're uncertain within that period of time. So, um, so there, you know, clearly the start date and the end date are very relevant for the time timing of the of the patient. But, but we do tend to simplify it in the query tool down to. We have um, yeah length of stay for the visit to medicine. So we have the end date. Yeah, we do. You can right. define so you can define it in the ontology. So we usually have. I'm thinking like obscure stuff now. So we do have in ontology. We'll have a concept called length of stay which um, is a, an SQL statement embedded inside of your ontology definition that's looking at the end date of the visit minus the start date. So you can drag in there, I'm looking for uh, inpatient stays where a person had a diagnosis code of COVID and you want the length of stay to be greater than uh, a week, something like that. So that's a, that, that is an out of the box thing that we do today, but it's a little complicated because you have to is sort of a trick getting the um, turning the date interval into a kind of atomic concept by embedding that logic inside of the SQL. But but you can do a query, right? Because you can use a combination of the temporal query and then use that inside the Venn diagram query. So you could do it. It just isn't well exposed in some ways. Yeah. It's j just tangentially related, but the start date. Start date can have multiple meanings. We came across a use case where somebody was interested in modeling patients' outcomes with uh, rule out MI based on troponin levels. And we went after a timestamp for the tests. And then they asked, well, is this timestamp when the blood was drawn, when it hit the lab, when the result was generated, when it hit the EMR? And so on, and all of those are, you know, could be interpreted as start dates. Right, and and Matt, the, this is a, I can't tell you how many times we've had that kind of conversation. I, I I try to get yes, you're right. So first, I mean, I try to you know think in terms of like, okay, when does that, despite when it was measured, when did the observation occur, right? So in a blood test, for example, it's when the blood was drawn from the body. Now the problem is you don't always have that. In fact, very rarely actually do you have that. Usually you have the test date and it's better than nothing, that's for sure, right? But sometimes it's, it, it, you can have like 24 hours in between and it can make a big difference. And you know, you have, so, so that's one. The other thing is um, sometimes it's valid though to have multiple dates. You wanna store multiple dates. And I have to say, um, like Griffin just uh, whispered in my ear, so that's, that's what we use the modifiers for sometimes. So we will have, you know, different start date associated with a concept, and then the modifier will tell you the meaning of the start date. But that is a that is a big question, and the decision you make, you know, can make a big difference in terms of how usable a database is. Because, you know, sometimes you pick the wrong start date, and then it doesn't really have the biological meaning that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, in four C um, when we first started four C. And there were very few patients with COVID, and the tests were taking a, a week or so to run. We would have the, some sites, the majority of the patients um, in our data sets were pending test results because we didn't, you know, or, we're having kind of, it was an exponential growth in number of COVID patients. So you would probably have most of your patients were in that week period of time while you're waiting for tests. So the, um, you would try to come up with index dates. And again, it was, it was 
the difference between the date when they got the COVID test and when the test result came in and when you thought they were infected, um, you know, it was it was much more amplified um, for that than what you, we usually see. Often, if you know, there's a white blood cell count done for an inpatient, you're getting the result back soon. So if you're doing the date without the timestamp, it's all kind of equivalent. But that was an example where we were really trying to figure out how to handle some of the analysis um, two years ago uh, with the delays in the PCR test. Okay. So uh, changing topic from time to modifiers. <laughs> so as you, as you talked about it, so is the concept still around to describe biomaterial? Uh, you draw from a, a person. So we used it a lot in, in former times to get biomaterial data together with clinical data. It was absolutely useful in I2B. Is it still around this concept? A, and B, uh, will it show up in, on the Transmart site at one point in time? You could say early next year, that's pretty okay. <laughs> so, um, so as you know, right, you can introduce any concept you want into I2B2, right, including any modifier you would like as well. So it's always available for you to introduce a new modifier for that. Um, the issue we've had with mod modifiers, just to editorialize a little bit, is that querying for them is really difficult. And so um, the way to, I mean, the, we, we, and, and it could be easier. The problem was, you know, we tried to do a generic interface that would work for all different situations. And really, we probably should focus on certain sets of modifiers and have their own little query box, right, for each set. You know, like, you know, is it a, discharge diagnosis or an admit diagnosis kind of thing. Just have a box for that and, you know, okay. But the, um, okay. So yes, you can do it. And I don't know if there's no standard modifier for it, but you could certainly yeah, it was, develop it. Was it was quite know. simple. So you select a set of patients in a court and ask, do I have, which material do I have uh, about those patients? Very Ooh. simple. Very Ooh, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what it would, so that's a very involved question, Ulrich, because then it has to do with how you want to structure your, your, your vocabulary in terms of like, what's your primary concept and what's your modifier? I, I'm looking at the clock, because I don't uh, want I think it's good enough, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Transmart, so. I, this, is, this has been turning <laughs> into a roadmap discussion to a stumpy expert. <laughs> uh, well, Griffin's not stumped yet, so. I do. I mean, we do. We, 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 we do. We have reservations for six. So we, we do need to, to, to um, we do need to uh, stop the stumping. Yes. Can I just, can I just, <laughs> what's that? Oh, that's really important. So I, this, this could be, this could go on for all night. Like so, but I just wanted to. I really just want. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, if you're not coming back tomorrow, if you would take the survey, take a minute to to do the survey. Otherwise, if you're coming back tomorrow, you can do it tomorrow. Um, I can send out a, a note later as well. I, I wanted to thank well, obviously the sponsors for um, for helping us. I want to I want to thank the speakers. Everybody did a a, real, a lot of work pulling a lot of stuff together. So they were for dynamite, dynamite, and a. A special, special shout out for three people who really tremendously, Desiree, who is not in the room, but she's in the back, say thank you to her as you, uh, as you walk through. Oh, there she is. She did all the logistics for this conference, and let me tell you, she also did all the logistics for the Red Cap conference. Red Cap has like almost 400 people, and like <laughs> this woman is going on vacation on Sunday. Um, <laughs> And, and Mark, thank you so much for like helping out with the, all the stuff that makes me nervous and Fran for helping with the introduction, so. <laughs> Here tomorrow, so um, come, on, come on in and we got, tomorrow will be more interactive, working groups and we got the in-act session and then some hands-on um, you know, uh, stuff. So it'll be a little, a very different format from, from today. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Diane. And thank you to Diane.